put a disk of plasma around it. And uh, then you add a magnetic field. And then I'll just let it go, and you can watch what happens. The differ differential rotation of the disk and the fact that the uh, upper portion of the field lines are retarded, and these are the ones at the bottom are spinning faster, it creates a, uh, a twisted field, field situation like a barber pole. And since plasma cannot cross magnetic field lines, the plasma is pushed upward. And in addition, because the field lines are wrapped around, the plasma is also squeezed into a, into a collimated flow. So from a, uh, the magnetic field takes a rotating flat object of gas and produces a collimated flow perpendicular to it. I think that's one of the wonders of nature myself. And that's what Heber Curtis saw 100 years ago sticking out of M87. And there's a black hole down there that's uh, doing just this. So uh, some people sometimes ask, well, what do black holes do? What, what good are they? Uh, and uh, they, they actually do an immense, immense amount of things in the universe, particularly. Uh, they, uh, it's their exhaust systems. So uh, radiation <coughs> they produce uh, could ionize the, uh, the whole universe. There's controversy between that and hot stars. But they're, they're a good uh, candidate for that. Their winds are so powerful that they actually can drive out the gas from the galaxy in which they reside. And then that would shut off star formation. And it's believed that the, uh, the event of the producing a very rapidly accreting black hole that, that's driving out winds is one of the main mechanisms for turning off star formation in galaxies. Uh, jets do something similar, but they, they're not uh, spherically directed, they're, they're uh, linearly directed, and so they can blow bubbles here in the uh, clusters that, uh, that surround galaxies. And uh, they, uh, the, the forward motion of the jet can also cause shocks which, which produce stars. And uh, something that no one thinks about is that these very fast um, jets of, of ionized particles moving very near the speed of light are actually very uh, immense particle beams. Uh, and if there are, and probably were, uh, alien civilizations sitting in the path of these jets, they are no more. And these jets often process around in the galaxy. So yeah, if you're in a galaxy with a very powerful jet, you're have uh, some chance of being in danger. Similar thing for small black holes. Um, the, when jets in a uh, collapsing stellar core uh, exit the core, they actually impinge on the inside of the, uh, the envelope, and they can actually uh, help and assist in the explosion. This is a, a picture of a SS-433. It's, it's a star that was exploded some time ago. Um, and uh, these jets also can impinge from the, from the stars, they can impinge on the interstellar medium itself and, and start stirring it up a lot of turbulence. So, um, it actually is 20 after. I don't know what you want to do. The rest of this is, is physics and how uh, black holes are actually uh, classified using uh, accretion states. Shall I continue? Sorry? There's probably another um, Um, 
So uh, this, this is all about now fueling the black hole. And as uh, when you throw material at a black hole, if it's, uh, at, if it's being used at about 10% efficiency producing energy, um, it will eventually generate uh, more than a trillion times of the luminosity of the sun for every solar mass of material it, it burns in year. Um, and so you can write that as the luminosity is, is a trillion solar masses. The solar luminosity is times the attrition rate in any 10 minutes. But it'll choke when this luminosity equals uh, the, the limit that uh, where the variation pressure exceeds the force of gravity on the electrons, or actually the force of gravity on the electron proton here. And this is that luminosity, 30,000 solar luminosities for every solar mass. And if you set this equal to this and solve for the accretion rate, you get something called the Eddington accretion rate. And it is the accretion rate, it's, remember, it's, it's uh, proportional to the mass of the black hole. And what that means is that 140 solar mass black hole will choke on the gas you're trying to throw at it when that's only one Earth mass per year. You throw one Earth mass at a 140 solar mass black hole, it'll begin to try to kick it out. Whereas if you have a 100 million solar mass black hole, it won't start choking until it has, you're throwing two solar masses of gas at it per year. And what this gives us is another, uh, another axis in our, our diagram. Here we have the black hole mass log of it. And here we have the log of the fueling rate, but we're measuring it in Eddington units. So here's the Eddington limit for all these different masses. Here's 10%, 1%, 10 times. And this is so, where the solar mass masses per year lie is on, on a diagram. So we use this diagram to classify different black hole systems by mass and by fueling rate. So now what we're trying to do is more than just classify things by orientation <coughs> or by um, the brightness of, uh, of different things. Um, this did not come out in color too well. And so it's not gonna be very useful. This is an NT diagram and uh, there are several colors here. Mm. This is a region where you have radiation pressure and electron scattering uh, in the plasma in an interior of a star or something. And as you go down in temperature, uh, you, you no longer have uh, radiation pressure, you have gas pressure, and you have, uh, no longer have electron scattering, you have actual absorption of photons causing the opacity. Um, but these are color coded in, in uh, it's purple, that's actually blue, and that's uh, green, and this is red. And obviously then the other, uh, the, the other images won't show up in color. So I uh, guess I can easily go to the end of the slides. <laughs> um, so uh, I, will, I will talk to some of these. Here, here is the region in this diagram where your radiation pressure dominated and electron scattering dominated. Here, you still have electron scattering, but now uh, gas pressure. And gas pressure meaning plasma pressure. And now way down here, you're like the sun. You just have regular absorption opacity and regular gas pressure. The, um, it turns out though that the lower part uh, is, is so optically thin but uh, it, it takes up a much larger region right here of accretion rate. This looks good color-wise. The lowest accretion rate category is the low heart state. And in that state, you have a very geometrically thick and very hot torus, so hot that the electrons themselves are two billion degrees and the protons are up to a trillion during the center of the black. 
The sec second state is much cooler. So for example, for a tensile mass black hole, it's only five million degrees in the center of the disk. And for a, um, a black hole here that's of order uh, 10 to 4, it's, it's less than a million degrees in the center of the disk. That's actually cool. And the disk is thin, doesn't produce a jet, it's, uh, it's very stable and quiet. There's a third one, which is what would have been the green area. And it's very similar in the sense that it's, it's thin, but it's very unstable. There's an instability that causes it to puff up and become thermally hot. Uh, and it's called the very high and un unstable state. And that's when the throttle is, is pretty high now. It's up, up to nearly uh, an Edmonton luminosity. And in that state, you get something very interesting. You get uh, a cycle that produces jets. For 95% of the cycle, it just sits there as a fairly thin disk. And then, for 5% of it, this thermal instability puffs it up, produces a jet when it's in this fat state. And then it cools off and goes back down and sits as a thin disk for a while. So that's one way in which black holes can actually produce jets. An interesting thing is that for a stellar mass black hole in a binary, uh, the cycle time is, is only about a quarter of an hour. But for a black hole out here that's a billion solar masses, the cycle time is a million years. So we can look at a black hole system like a quasar and say, oh, it's not unstable. It's, we've looked at it for a decade, and it hasn't done anything. But the cycle time here is a million years, and so it very well is doing something. And finally, there's the choke state, which was colored orange here in the, in the diagram. And what happens is that now you're getting so much stuff flowing toward the black hole, the radiation pressure uh, pushes it out and produces this tremendous wind explosion, which can drive uh, gas out of the galaxy and shut off star formation. So there are two inefficient parts. One where the fuel, most of the fuel falls into the black hole, and the one where most of the fuel is blown out. And this is what luminosity contours look like. They're not diagonals like the accretion contours. And so in the very beginning we showed what we're really interested in is the luminosity of the, sorry, what we're really interested in is the accretion rate and we predict the luminosity of what we can compare are the theoretical luminosity predictions with the uh, observed luminosity of different objects. And that's how we've gotten to that point. Okay, so what I'm going to do is run through this slide. And we're almost done. This is where uh, let me leave those off. Uh, <coughs> this is where we can now place all of those different objects that we uh, we were puzzling about in the very first few slides of the talk. Here are the X-ray binaries. They're down here at a few solar masses, stellar mass black holes. Here are the ultra-luminous X-ray sources. They're above the Eddington limit and probably driving out strong winds. Here are the hyperluminous sources. Similarly, but they have uh, they have a similar accretion rate in Eddington units, but a much bigger accretion rate in solar masses per year because they are much bigger objects. And here's HLX1 right there. Secret galaxies and uh, Quasars all lie in this instability slip, strip, and uh, in fact, right here we have an object like GRO uh, 1650 plus, uh, GRS 1915 plus uh, 105 right here, which is also unstable. So this whole instability strip has has very interesting objects lying in it, and low luminosity objects like our own galaxy are down here with very low accretion. In fact, this one is our own galaxy is way down here, at kind of minus six or seven. Anything. I uh, now put up the, the LURGs, and they, they lie up here in Super Eddington and nearly Eddington areas. Uh, and this is borne out by my observations. 
So we're getting pretty good at putting things on this diagram. As far as radio uh, log quasars and radio galaxies are concerned, we're uh, pretty sure this is the way it is, but we don't know exactly uh, how the spinning black hole produces these jets, or I should say, we don't know how a, a, an accretion disk working with a spinning black hole exactly produces the powerful jets that we, uh, that we observe. So uh, I, uh, this is my last slide. I'll, I'll just finish here uh, with, by reading the main titles. Black hole research is sort of in the same state as other sciences. We, we, uh, we have a good idea of the basic types of objects and, the, and a good classification scheme. We understand the basic physical principles uh, and we know why observed black holes have all the different properties they have. Um, we, we still don't understand all the details, which is the weather that occurs down in the accretion disk and the, and the jets and so on. Um, and so I've listed a number of things here, questions that, uh, that we still have. And one of the biggest unsolved problems are these very powerful jets. We don't have a good way of making an accretion disk produce a powerful jet for the millions of years that we know uh, these objects actually make powerful jets. So I uh, think I will stop there, and uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Sorry, I, could you could you start at the very beginning of your question? Can we um, go the massive the massive black hole transform the supermassive black hole? Uh, well, the way they transform is by eating other material. Right, mass. Uh, they grow, um, and there there are a number of ways that I illustrated there. It could one a massive black hole could absorb more um, more gas in the mergers. It could absorb more black holes, or um, it can uh, eat up uh, stars that come near it. But, so, uh, is that your question, or, or do you is that your, is it leading to your question? Yeah, yeah, right, right. So, um, the well, the true question I want to ask is if is there any evolution point that like the diagram shows of the nice black hole mass and also the um, failing rate? Yeah, so we have different categories of the black hole. Not yet. Right. So, you know, the diagram usually you want to try to figure out some evolution track mm -hmm. between different, so, yeah, different types. Yeah. So right. Um, no, I have not seen any uh, any evolution <laughs> tracks like that. Um, you would you would think something like the HR diagram, for example. Something like that. Um, there is a diagram similar to the HR diagram. Um, but it's evolution on a much, much faster time scale, and it's for the stellar mass black holes. Um, it's called the, um, uh, uh, well, it's a, it is a, it's a color luminosity diagram. It's the X-ray intensity, um, and it's a ratio, hardness. It's a hardness and the X-ray intensity diagram. And it's uh, almost like the HR diagram, but it's flipped, so that the uh, the hardest uh, is on the uh, this, this is you looking at it. The hardest uh, intensity are are on the right hand side, and the softest are on the left. And it's for these these X-ray binaries that go through states very quickly over weeks, and they have all kinds of tracks in those diagrams. And then there's a line where when someone crosses that line, they produce a jet. So there are such diagrams being, I, I actually call that one the um, fender baloney gallop diagram, that BG diagram, just like we call Hertz, Hertz from Russell. Bob, Rob Fender will not, he's too shy, he won't, he won't own that. But it really was invented by them, and it's really beautiful. You, uh, other people call it the turtle diagram. And the reason is that the, the tracks, the main tracks, 
look like uh, a turtle's neck here, a uh, turtle's head. There's an eye, and there's even a smile. Some some uh, black holes go back and forth in there. So uh, the, this is a very nice diagram. It's difficult to have something like that for supermassive, massive and supermassive black holes because we don't observe their, um, uh, their, their lifetimes uh, that quickly. And we don't know enough yet about the details of theory to do what we've done for the HR diagram, and that is actually produce evolutionary, theoretical evolutionary tracks. That should be coming, <laughs> but I, don't, I couldn't give you an estimate, 10 years, 20 years, 15 years, I don't know. Thank you. What is the prediction for the uh, evolution tracks or the X-ray binaries? If any observation, yes? Okay. Well, actually, those aren't predictions. Those are um, actual observed tracks. Observed tracks. Observed tracks. And now the challenge is to uh, predict why they are doing that. One reason, obviously, if it goes up in intensity, X-ray intensity, it's beginning to accrete more moves across toward being a softer um, uh, source, uh, it's going from having a disk that's very dimensionally thick and hot to one that's having a, a, a thin and softer disk. So people know what's happening roughly, but to, nobody that, that I've seen, I've not seen any work on actually predicting the evolutionary tracks in those diagrams. That would be really nice. Rental mass versus uh, rental building rates. It seems uh, the high state is missing for supermassive rental case. Could you explain more about that? Yes, um, it would have been easier to see that if we could have seen the colors uh, on the uh, NT diagram. Because the in the NT diagram, the blue part, where you have um, material that is uh, gas pressure dominated, but uh, the opacity is electron scattering. It's a very thin uh, wedge in the NT diagram itself. What, what's happening is that as you get to uh, higher and higher masses, the, um, the, the radius at which, well, let me use some terms I didn't introduce. There's, um, in, these, in these states, <coughs> There's the, uh, what, Shakura and Sunyaya, right? Do you know who they are? Uh, there's uh, Nikolai Shakura and uh, Rashid Sunyaya, two Russians, developed this, these theories of uh, accretion. They're very analytic. They, you know, you can solve all equations by hand um, and get some nice, nice uh, predictive equations. Um, and there are three different accretion states that they came up with. Um, one was called, um, the outer region, because and it's cool and it's thin and it's uh, because it's electron. Sorry, it's, uh, it's absorption capacity and, and gas pressure. Further inward, they called it the middle region, and then very far inward, they called it the inner region. And the inner region is radiation pressure dominated and electron scattering. This one is uh, gas pressure and electron scattering. This is gas pressure. Um, but it turns out that if you change the accretion rate, then uh, if you go low enough, the inner region will disappear and just have a middle region and then, a, and then an outer region. Or if you crank up the accretion rate, the, um, the regions will, will move out. You might even have a super Eddington uh, region in the center. As you change the black hole mass, the radius, the boundary radius, between these regions changes in relative distance. And as you increase the mass of the black hole, the, um, the, the radius, the, there's an inner and middle radius, and there's a middle and outer radius. And as you increase the mass of the black hole, the, those, the, the size of that region gets narrower and narrower 
until it it just disappears, and then you just have an inner region and an outer region, and uh, and the outer region and that ends up becoming this geometrically thick thing rather than uh, what Schrems and I thought it was. So what's happening is it has to do with the um, the, the way the accretion actually creates heat and how thick the disk is and how, how optically thin uh, it is. And the, the middle region, which is very stable, it just, just kind of disappears. And this you kind of see in, in the quasars. You see the quasars in secret galaxies. They're in the optical. They're, they seem to be rather unstable. They're, they're turning and bubbling. Um, that's similar in, in the uh, optical, uh, in the uh, X-ray binaries in that in, in unstable region. But the X-ray binaries do have an actual soft state. So uh, we have to look at it uh, in more detail if you want to know the exact uh, physics behind it. Well, I've described to you a, a, a rough uh, a rough thing of what's happening is that as you go higher in mass, that region just disappears. And you just have basically for quasars and secrets, you have a big unstable region. You have a black hole. screen and then you'll be able to see the, yeah, the, the color the colored regions in the NT diagram and how they map into the uh, accretion rate black hole diagram. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.